This is the Happy Rant Sports Podcast, in which Ted Cluck and Barnabas Piper rant about old sports, new sports, sports books, sports movies, and anything else related to sports that they feel like. Enjoy. Hey, welcome to the Happy Rant Sports Podcast. I am Ted Cluck, joined, as always, in studio by my good friend, my partner in sports radio, Barnabas Piper. Pipe a little peek behind the production curtain here at Happy Rent Corporate. We were supposed to do a regular app this morning, and uh, Ronald has a brand new computer. He's our boy's very excited, uh, just surrounded by technology there in Ashland. And uh, after five or ten minutes of struggle, Ron just tapped out. So he's got the computing power of a small country now, so that he can open up Word and write a sermon. Uh, but he couldn't. He couldn't get it going, pipe. And I think uh, he actually writes sermons in moleskins. Yeah, dude. So I didn't even know what our, the boy uses his computer for anymore, because uh, he's not buying plane tickets. Um, he does his Yoda work on his phone, I'm guessing. Which he's he's been out of control with that, dude. Yeah, uh, and in fuego, he has. Yeah. Uh, he's he's yeah, on fire. Quarantine has it's, really brought the best out of him. Yeah, his Twitter game is 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 on fire right now. Like, okay, so. Uh, and we will get into sports, I promise. But but for Ron, I think networking on Twitter kind of is his sport. You know what I'm saying? He approaches it like an athlete would. Um, he's he's up at six. He's up early. He's putting the work in. You know, he's at the facility. He's just grinding on Twitter. Of all the people that Ron is trying to work right now on Twitter, who would you say, Pipe? This is like a this is like a mock draft for Ronald. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're Mel Kiper right now, mocking Ronald's. Um, Ronald's prospects. So of all the people he's trying to work on Twitter right now, like who's the most likely for him to actually get a project going with? Oh man, who was he? Who was he engaging with yesterday? Uh, I mean, let's leave Jared C out of this because that's a given. Yeah, Jared C is like the Joe Burrow of this mock draft. Yeah, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna leave Jared out of it. That one's yeah, that one's been written into the first pick. Just like that's a yeah. shoe in. Um, Dude, on that though, just real quick, do you think our boy's ever going to make make any money off of Jared C. Wilson? Like, <laughs> real, real talk, do you think, do you think that's going to happen? Well, I think I don't think Jared is a money man. You know, okay. like there there are there are connections where you can make real money. You know, sure. big sure, sure, speaking sure. gigs. Yeah. Um, you know, books that sell actual large quantities. Yeah. Um, I I think. I think Jared does fine for himself, you know, because sure. that's what happens when you write 11 books a year uh, yeah. and take December off. But um, I don't think he's one of those like he's not he's not providing Ron like a one of those speaking gigs. It's like we will pay you eight thousand dollars to. Right. Yeah. To, like to real move the 40 needle minutes or yeah, yeah, yeah. or like we're going to co-author something that sells 200,000 copies. Exactly. Um, so exactly. yeah, I I think I think they will find a way to be profitable to mm-hmm. to be in the black, if you will, but uh, yeah. but probably yeah. not real money. Yeah, no, that's a good word, man. So of of everybody else that Ronald's working on Twitter right now, like who who are you drafting for him to actually do a project with? Man, I feel like I feel like it's, if putting this in the terms of of draft rumors, there's so much yeah. misdirection. A little bit like what Miami did with Tua, where they're like, well, I don't know. I think we like Justin Herbert better, et cetera. <laughs> Dude, et cetera. it's subterfuge right now, man. Yeah, there's I, a lot of subterfuge on I Ron think, Twitter. I think Ronnie is. I think he probably has an angle in his own mind. He's like, I I know who I'm targeting, yeah. but I'm gonna just put out all this rumor flack, tweet flack, so that you can't see through it. And uh, yeah, and so it, it, man, it's really hard to tell. He's um, widely like he's the he's the opposite of like Dave Gettleman. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> Ron, meaning he's smart and good at his job. Well, meaning he's just wily. He's 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 tech savvy. You know, he's putting a he's putting some like. Wait, 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 wait. Is he tech savvy? <laughs> he couldn't figure out how to make us think no, of dude, iPad is, work to record. He this is thing. Dave Gettleman, actually. That's right. He's he's Dave Gettleman. Here, here's the analogy for Ron. OK, he's Dave Gettleman in like. um. Uh, Tom Dimitrov clothing. You know what I mean? He he, he goes around <laughs> like so the little true. the little wafy hipster, but he's in inside he's actually Dave Gettleman. You know what I mean? You know who he is? Uh, who is who who is the uh Packers coach? Matt uh Oh yeah, yeah, Matt LaFleur. Okay, so Matt LaFleur is this offensive genius who then runs the draft as if it's nineteen ninety two and he's like, We wanna 
totally a big between the tackles back and eleven blocking tight ends and and a second quarterback into, to develop. He that's, turned into Tom Coughlin on draft night. It was amazing transfer. That's who Ronnie is. It's like it, yeah, you yeah. know, he's got the he's got the reputation, he's got the look, and he's completely old school. Totally, totally. Yeah, dude. So, w- which one of these? Which one of these projects is really going to pop for him? I of think, all the guys that he's working, I think his best bet is in the is in the gospel coalition realm. Uh, yeah. set, setting aside Jared C. That one's that one's yeah, a good yeah, one. yeah yeah that one's off the table. Um, so yeah, it, it has to be in that realm. I could see. I I, I honestly I haven't kept total track because the quantity is just overwhelming and. Uh, yeah. I would say he has two options. One is a fellow creative type, and they do something in the musing, in the musing yes. arena. So pastoral I musings like on. Yeah, if you're an ex musician or like an ex creative of some kind, you can get, you know, they'll they'll throw like four grand at you to do yeah. a little like some some kind of like ethereal musings kind of kind of book. I could see that, dude. So who would it be? Would it be like a, I don't know, Mike Cosper, like Matty Boswell? I know he's working those guys. He has. Yeah, I, for a I think while, it would have so. to be more worship pastor guy because yeah. the guys who are who truly view themselves as creatives are. Uh, they're are, doing uh, creative work. Yeah, they're <laughs> well, or they're trying, and uh, yeah. they're just not easy to work with. Like they, everything yeah. has to be just their way. There's not going to be very collaborative. Whereas, like a worship pastor, songwriter type is that collaborative is how that that goes. So yeah, I could yeah. see like a. Yeah, uh, a Cosper, uh, not a Cosper, a uh, Boswell or like an Aaron Ivy or somebody like that. The other yeah. option, the other option is, you know, Ronnie still has sort of this church planter vibe to him, but he's been a pastor yeah. there for like, what, seven years or something? Dude, Ron, yeah, Ron's, he's an interesting mix of like still riding the church planter train, but tweeting as though he's been pastoring for 30 years. Well, and you know also, what I, mean? I think people have the impression that he's like 34 and he's not, he's, um, yeah. he's got a little more life under his belt, but, right, uh, right. so I could see him trying to work out something with like an old pastor, like okay. the, one of the, the senior statesman types to yeah. kind of do a, uh, an, a, a father figure, mm. kind of book, you know, a co-authoring with somebody who he yeah. looks up to. But it would have to be in the vein of a Eugene Peterson style, so not like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's not gonna he's not gonna go to like an old crusty reformed guy who wants to write seven points on something. Again, it's sort of in the pastoral musings, but with the old guy. Yeah. Dude, that sounds money to me. That sounds like a that's a high upside pick. That's like taking Micaiah Becton. The music the music pastor thing, dude. That that feels to me like it would sell eleven hundred copies and be forgotten immediately. Um, like the books that I did with Ron. Well, see, um, and I, I think I think worship pastors as I think worship pastors have sort of fallen off as as like literary personalities. There was an yeah, era yeah. where you know Chris Tomlin, Matt Redman, um, yeah. all the Hillsong, uh, Passion Worship, all of like there's just you just knock them out. Could write yeah. a book and it was guaranteed to it was guaranteed to make its money back. Um, totally. I I worked with a couple different worship pastors on books and we had very moderate expectations and they hit them in like the first two like month or two just because there was there was an era 7 to 15 years ago where yeah. that stuff sold and I don't think anybody nobody's looking to Hillsong worship to write a book now. Nah, dude, those guys kind of became punchlines overnight and I don't know how it happened. Probably cuz guys like us made fun of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it worked. I don't know. Yeah, it worked. I don't know, man. Yeah, I I like the old sage pastor thing because I, I think he's trying to kind of work this corner where he's trying to become like the voice of pastors. But to do that, like you gotta you gotta do the co author gig with a with a big one. Okay, you know? here's here's option three for Ron. Speaking of voice okay. to pastors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um it is the it is the church in hard places, church in small places thing. So that's a yeah. that's sort of a rising niche. Yep. Uh, yeah, small which, town church has become the new like city church. Which, you in, know, in all, in all seriousness, I'm really glad yeah. it's happening. I think that's no, great. Me too. Um, yep. I think healthy churches in those places is is awesome. Uh, yeah. So that would be. I'm trying to like look, the sports comparison. There is going to be sort of the um, 
he has a vision for how to play a position differently than it's been played before. So, so sort of like when yeah, yeah, the 49ers yeah. signed Kyle Juszczyk and everybody was like, yeah. wait, you're paying how much to a fullback? They're like, he's not a fullback. He's a left guard meets move tight end who also plays totally. fullback. And yeah. so that would be sort of Ronnie's move there where it's like, that seems like a, you know, a bit of a stretch, but also we're seeing how this can be done effectively now. So, Dude, you know what the comp is for this year? It's Isaiah Simmons. You know, it could yeah. be amazing, right? I mean, it could be this really paradigm-shifting, high-upside thing, or it could be kind of a disaster. Um, but even if Isaiah Simmons is a disaster, he's still on the field for seven or eight years. He's just not dominant, right? Like, he's not Lawrence Taylor. He's not you know, Carl Banks, he's not one of these like game altering yeah. linebackers. Um, I think that one, that one has a lot of upside pipe. Um, the one with the old pasture is it's like taking a franchise left tackle. Like, you yeah. know, it's going to work out. The risk is low. The one with the music guy, that's, that's the Raiders picking a guy who runs four three. Yeah, totally dude. That's, that's Henry Ruggs. Um, where he runs four three, but he might catch twenty one balls a year, and uh, and be Darius Hayward back. and and has a quarterback who doesn't throw the ball downfield. But <laughs> exactly, let's not get ahead of ourselves with uh, with these. You have a guy analysis. that can run really fast downfield, and a quarterback who likes to throw it like two yards past the line of scrimmage on a on a long play. So uh, yeah, figure that one out, Piper. But uh, but alas, it will be uh, it will be interesting to see how our boy. Um, leverages this quarantine because he's I'm really I'm starting to see now the vision um, you take him off the road he's still networking um, he's just I, working different people I've got a fourth option okay uh, Ooh. this is this like the is this like the the sleeper trade offer that comes in like late in the draft clock yeah dude this okay. is the crazy this is like the Colts taking Trev Alberts instead of Trent Dilfer in 1994 and Mel Kuyper went crazy um and it, and it ended up not working out for the Colts. Um, and it will probably end up not working out for Ronald for similar reasons. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I could see him trying to partner with a woman. Um, just because our boy likes to do stuff that hasn't been done before. And um, that would be like reform pastor partnering with a woman. Okay, so here's the thing. that That's, that's going to be on the upswing, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. because like complementarianism has gotten so polarized that, yeah, that it's you got to like, there's like the middle ground. So, so there's a guy named, uh, Eric Schumacher who wrote a book with, uh, I think with Elise Fitzpatrick recently. And it's, it's sort of about men and women partnering in ministry and, okay. and just sort of the bringing complementarianism to a point of sanity. And, uh, I think I could see Ronnie trying to do the same thing in but again in a much more sort of memoir uh yeah. reflective sort of way like i just think no matter what he does that's his essence it's not yeah. going to be a seven ways to or a yeah. like a you know four perspectives on or something like that yeah no it'll be like a hey look i'm i'm down with women shout outs <laughs> to women you know <laughs> like um now that being said, who do you think? What what do you think is the the floor and the ceiling for like women that he could get to write that book with him? How high does it go? Like he's shooting, is he shooting Jen Wilkin? I think I think that would be sort of his uh, that would be sort of his like man if if that worked out, you know. Uh, that's his like Joe Burrow falls to you because the Bengals do something stupid. Well, that's you know. yeah, that's like Miami actually taking Tua, where you're like, oh, all of this was a smokescreen, and all along they were going to make the right decision. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That except except that in this case, it's not really Ronnie's choice. <laughs> yeah, Ron's he, he, would, got a little, he, he would have to be drafted by Jen Wilkin. <laughs> he's got a little post-it note in his in his like skinny jeans pocket that says Jen Wilkin, no matter what. Shout out to the movie Draft Day, which was bad, but. Um, but yeah, dude, that's that's interesting. Yeah, um, I I could see. I think I think that would be. I don't know, man. I I don't see him. I don't see him sort of ministerially interacting with a lot of like women who are known for being in ministry. Like he's he's certainly. Yeah. Like, I mean, Twitter just does not set up that way. Like it's either relational yeah. or it's business, but very rarely yeah. is there like the kind of the the crossover type of thing. Yeah, that's true. I don't see him hitting up like Jen Wilkins timeline but like 
I, I could see him working some other some other angles there. But yeah, that's the fourth option. That's Henry Ruggs. It's a it's a it's a shot in the dark, you know. But I could see it. I could see. I wouldn't be shocked. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, interesting scenarios, Piper. Interesting quarantine next project draft day scenarios for our boy. Um, it'll it'll be fun to see what actually happens, if anything. Um, the Piper we got on here ostensibly not to talk about Ronald, but to talk about the actual NFL draft for a minute, and then talk about the Last Dance. Uh, ESPN's Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls documentary that's sweeping the nation because there's literally nothing else on to watch and also because it's great. Uh, real quick on the draft, man. Um, thoughts on the Packers uh, taking Jordan Love in the first round and basically extending a huge middle finger to their current quarterback, uh, Aaron oh, Rodgers. I loved everything about what the Packers did. Um, yeah. Speaking purely as a Vikings fan. Oh, from, totally. a, from a team management standpoint, I think they just fell flat on their face. It was the, it was the worst. It, they didn't do anything that, that made their team better this year. Yeah. They, they made it to the NFC Championship game where they got completely obliterated. Yeah. But then, then they didn't make their team better. And they totally. lost players in free agency who were fairly valuable contributors. So I loved it. I thought it was amazing. I thought making one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL very angry uh, and probably making him not want to play in your team for very much longer is great. Um, Dude, also, he's a fun guy to make angry. It's like when you were um, a kid and a jerk and you would put like a piece of tape on a cat's paw just to see what they would do. <laughs> like, I, I feel like this is... The, this is the NFL draft equivalent. You take a really mean, petty cat and just like Jordan Love is the piece of tape, you know? Yeah. Dude, dude to frame this in like terms that our tribe would understand. Um, so Aaron Aaron, uh, Aaron Rodgers and Rob Bell were boys. Um, Rob Bell probably responsible for like leading Aaron Rodgers away from the faith. Yeah, Aaron um, Rodgers more or less said that in an interview maybe yeah. uh, sometime last year. It was yeah, it was a Mina Kimes piece. It was really yeah. good. It was a good feature, but uh, very sad. Um, anyway, so so Rob leads A-Rod away from the faith. Do you think Rodgers called Rob Bell after, uh, after Jordan Love got drafted? And how do you think the conversation went? What do you think Rob's like advice to him was? I, I mean... It, Wait, Rob Bell gives advice? I mean, I feel like his well, advice is just sort of like embrace the universe and you do you. Um, yeah, embrace the universe, embrace the uncertainty. It was probably something like that, you know. Yeah, like, and then he like he gave him like a mantra to chant, sort of like, you know, the Adam Sandler movie Anger Management or something. Um, exactly. I, I feel like, yeah, I don't, I, don't see, I don't see Rob Bell helping angry Aaron Rodgers very much. I also don't think like, so tying together our two topics for today which are the draft yeah. and michael jordan i don't think aaron Rodgers is the kind of player who gets better when he's mad mm. i feel like he's the type who's going to like his body language is going to suck like he's not going to pull his team to higher heights out of intensity i feel like he's going to end up just yeah. throwing the ball at the back of an offensive lineman's head or something and Dude, just that's a great point rolling out getting chased out of bounds and then just spiking the ball on his coach's clipboard uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see this going well, which again, thrills me, uh, just with glee. I, I also, Dude, I, I don't think, is there any reason to think Jordan Love is good? No, man. He, he throws a lot of interceptions. He, yeah. He threw 20 and picks at Utah state or what, he, whatever it is. I think it was, Utah he throws state. a lot of picks. He's athletic. He has a similar makeup to uh, Patrick Mahomes and read into that, whatever you want to read into it. But um, I think I think Jordan Love should write Patrick Mahomes a, a thank you note, uh, because I think in a Mahomes less world, Jordan Love is a sixth round pick. Yeah, I feel like uh, he's the he's the Darius Miles or Jonathan Bender to Kevin Garnett, you know, dude, like, totally. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. Just, he's like, oh, he looks the same. And yeah. so he must be the same. And or he's the Her he's the Harold Miner to Michael Jordan. Yeah, you know, shout out Baby Jordan. But uh, speaking of Michael Jordan, dude, and you and your very insightful comment on angry Aaron Rodgers, I think Jordan was one of those rare people who, like, he gets more charismatic when he's angry. Um, and you're seeing it in the docs, right? So Jordan's famous for you know being petty, being angry, holding grudges. Those are all bad things, right? Like just to be clear 
from a spiritual standpoint, they're not good things. They'll eventually like harden your heart and eat your soul up and make you a miserable person. But which you see in the documentary, because at no point does he refer to anybody as his friend. Dude, you're so right, man. You're so right. And in fact, you you see you see little snippets of friendship, but it's very flyby, right? Like like so when he's did you Oh, you're behind, dude. So you didn't see this. But the the very last app, man, there was this incredible like four minute segment of Jordan hanging out with the security guys at the United Center mm-hmm. because that's who he spends all his time with, right? So this guy reached a you know, just this monumental level of fame where he can't go anywhere. He can't do anything except like hang out backstage with his security detail basically. And, and he's so pathologically competitive that he's like pitching quarters at a wall with a security guy and they're, they're gambling on it, of course. Right. And the, the, the quote was basically, you know, why do you want to win a buck off a security guy at the United center? And Jordan's just like, because I want to see your money in my wallet, you know? So just pathologically competitive, but, you know, really charming, really winsome. Obviously, these guys were like over the moon to be hanging out with Michael Jordan. Uh, but yeah, not a lot of deep friendships there, man, and not a lot of friendships at all. Um, everybody, even in the basketball realm in these docs, and I want to hear you on this, everybody was just very, uh, I guess, worshipful of Jordan. Even like the footage of him in all-star games or him in like the Olympic context, everybody was just deferring to him. So he's holding court in the locker room. Everybody's listening with rapt attention. It's a fascinating like male group dynamic, don't you think? Yeah, and I feel like it's something that could not exist today. Mm. Talk about that. Why not? I I it's I'm not I maybe it's a Maybe it's a generational thing where like hero worship was um was was a thing that just everybody had it. Like I remember growing up, like you you just there were athletes or actors or musicians and you just were sort of like, oh, I would I would, you know, be a gog in their presence. And I feel like that has changed to some degree because we're we're constantly trying to bring people down, not hero worship. Yeah. So LeBron is the best player in the NBA and has he's the best player since Michael Jordan. He's probably the second best player all time. If you're under 35, you think he's the best player all time and you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Um nod to Kareem for being maybe the greatest in terms of longevity, but Yeah. But nobody worships LeBron like that. Dude, that's so true. E- even yeah. even other like other players in the league are not intimidated by him. They're not uh he doesn't hold court with that same way. Like he has had to learn how to be friends with everybody as opposed to being Lord over everybody. Yeah. 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 That's a great point, dude. Here's the funny thing though, pipe. I realize, and we haven't gotten to the end of the doc. So like cop caveats all over the place about that. I, I think one of the, one of the purposes of this doc in a way was to show what an a-hole Jordan was, except that, <laughs> As I'm watching it, like, I have the opposite feeling. Like, even if he was an a-hole, like, I find, I find him to be wildly charismatic on this thing. Both in, in, the, in the retro footage, but also in the modern day interviews. Like, I like him. And maybe that's just because he mastered the art of being coquettish and winsome with the media such that, um, you know, he, he can, he's playing us all like a harp in which case tip of the cap, but like, I don't know, man. And I want, I want to hear you on that. I, I think, I think you're right. I, you know, you mentioned earlier that he got more charismatic as he got angrier and that's mm-hmm. because he, he did not care about the human aspect of anything. Yeah. Which meant that you didn't have to take it personally if he wasn't nice to you. Like that's he was, true. he was there for one reason and it was to destroy an opponent. Yeah. And he would just which is why his anger was charismatic because it was a it was a useful weapon. Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if anger is petulant, if whatever, that then it it it's not charismatic. And I think we have humanized athletes to such a degree now that, you know, like we're tracking who shares what emojis in response to whose Instagram posts. <laughs> exactly. And, and I think Jordan 
I don't know what he would have been like in this era, but there's no way that he could have been the same guy because he was he was super opaque as well. Totally. You know, I yep. there, there's the moment where, you know, when he won his first title. Yeah. There are people who are like, I'd only ever seen like the only emotions I'd seen were like anger and. Uh, yeah, dude. And excitement over winning, you know, big a big shot. And yeah. so to see that sort of emotion or then, you know, when his, you know, when his father passed away and these different things, like, emotion was the oddity. Uh, yeah, humanity right. was the oddity. It was the, it was the like, oh, he's not just a winning cyborg. Nobody has an aura anymore like that. And if yeah. anybody has an aura, the goal of everybody is to throw stones until it's like dented and broken. And Dude, so, so true. Yeah. I just, I think, I think he existed in a time that made him greater than what he was, but also allowed him to be great at what he did. Yeah. Because path- yeah. you can't be pathologically competitive like that. The closest is Tom Brady, I think. And and he's mastered the balance of being opaque and human while also pa- yeah. you know, pathological. Dude, but he's fake human. Yes. He's kind of faux human, yes. like Tom Cruise. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a very like shellacked, veneered, curated version of human. And interestingly, Brady has been able to navigate life as a famous person like Jordan without ever having to do politics. It's kind of a weird dispensation that he gets. You know what I mean? Like nobody's asking Brady, you know, Hey, where do you fall in the whole like quarantine controversy? You know, should we quarantine for three more years and, you know, make the government pay everybody a paycheck or should we get everybody back? Like nobody's asking him. And if they are, he's not answering, which is Jordan esque, right? Like I think, I think Brady is close enough in age to Jordan and Jeter and kind of the last wave of guys who didn't do political. Um, you know, he's kind of adopted that as a as a worldview, I guess, in terms of how to be a famous person. Yeah, but um, and I think I think uh, you know J- Jordan did something in his day. That I'm sure it was mildly controversial then. It would be the kind of thing that would completely ruin him today. You know, where he was talking about, um, they, I, I don't remember the circumstances, but it was when he made the comment, Republicans buy shoes too. Yeah. I think yeah, it was yeah, about endorsing dude. a presidential candidate it, or something. And he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Nah, man, Republicans buy shoes too. And yep. I think you and I both look at that and go, that makes total sense. Like, you don't yes. have to politicize everything. Um, yes. You know, you're here for your brand. Yep. Not, not to endorse Bill Clinton or whoever it was at the time, and uh, and I think that I saw people on Twitter getting mad about Jordan saying that in whatever it was, nineteen ninety two, yeah, yeah, uh, or ninety six or whatever, and and that's the difference in era. I think then yeah. there were some people who were like, "Man, I really wish he would have. It would have been a big deal. He had the most, like, his name carried the most weight." Whereas now. It's a it's you get canceled like you just yeah, Jordan totally. is canceled whatever his shoes won't sell it's just a yeah there, there's such a difference in, Dude, in thank era God. and what the expectations are thank God he came out pre Twitter you know what I mean Th- yeah like we got to enjoy him before the toilet of social media just took over all of our lives but um, yeah two interesting stories about that so we we met as a small group last night um, outside we were all six feet apart whatever. Blah, blah. <laughs> um, okay, can I make no, a quick no. can I make a quick comment on, on what you just said? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was discussing with a friend uh, yesterday how social distancing is the new Christians and drinking. You yeah, know, totally. It used totally. to be that when Christians would say they drink, they would immediately give all the caveats. So like it was, uh, it was a glass of wine. It was with dinner only yeah. like once or twice a week. That's the way with we were. My wife, social we were at home, dist- right? Yeah. And I, was, they, I wasn't alone. Other people were there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's social distancing now. It's like, oh, I was with some friends, but we were all we were outside. We were wearing masks. It was six feet apart. Uh, they left totally. early. They wore yeah, gloves. Totally. We didn't hug. <laughs> yeah, the new yeah. Drinking. We just. Yeah, exactly. Dude, it's 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 also the new Christian like I watched this rated R movie and there there are some things, you know, there's some things <laughs> that maybe you'll you know, yeah, you know some scenes, fast some forward. content. Yeah, dude. So we we were at the small group last night, six feet apart, and um this guy, one of my buddies, John, who's like just a couple of years younger than me, but he's he's definitely in the age era of having like grown up worshiping Jordan, but he grew up in the super uh, like super, super conservative kind of legalistic family. And, um, when the bulls signed and they were big bulls fans, 
But when the Bulls signed Dennis Rodman, he of the dyed hair and tattoos and piercings. And like gender pick, and androgynousness, yeah. androgyneity. Dude, right. right, right. His parents made him like box up all his Bulls gear, which is probably sweet gear because it was from the 90s. Oh, yeah. And, ma- and they mailed it back to the Bulls with like an angry note. Now, <laughs> keep in mind that okay, this was Karen. the same. Yeah, this was the same Bulls team that had, I don't know, Jordan maybe had a hundred mistresses and was gambling like a million dollars on golf matches. And, you know, so Jordan had his own issues, but because Dennis Rodman had like, I don't know, purple hair, we, we got to send back all our, our bulls gear. I thought that was an amazing, like time capsule Christian culture in the nineties sort of story. It was, it amazed me. Um, did you laugh when he said that or were you just like, you just stunned? No, I laughed and he was laughing like he's really good natured about it. But he he was telling it like, hey, this is a funny story. Um, And it was it was just hilarious to think like and it reminded me, Okay, so this is interesting. That was what being angry looked like pre Twitter. Right. But in a in a in a Twitter age, mom or dad would have like logged on and done this series of tweets where it went like four deep. You know, talking now, about they, what I'm- they would have done it on Facebook because Twitter would have been a bit much and that it would have been four paragraphs. And then one of those like shit, you know, uh, share if you're with me, if you don't share, you're of the devil kinds of things. Yeah, if you don't share, you're against me kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But pre social media, dude, you get, you know, you get PO'd in your own living room and, you know, maybe you make this big production out of like boxing up some bulls hats and like sending it back to the facility. Um, I don't know, man. It just, it just charmed me. It seemed innocent. You know what I mean? Like the, the thought of a, a dad in 1992, you know, wearing his Dockers and his, in his, uh, I don't know, uh, Izod golf shirt, like <laughs> angrily stuffing a box full of bulls gear and his kid being bummed out. Like, I don't, I don't get to wear my champion, like mesh bulls jersey anymore. What the heck? You know? Uh, I don't know. Something about that whole scenario is kind of like delightful. There's, there's also something really nice about the like the amount of effort and and there's physical costs. Like there's time costs. Yeah. There's money costs because I mean he didn't yeah. buy all that gear. His parents probably bought it for him, so it was their money. And right. uh, and so like they, there was a genuine investment in their vitriol, which again, yeah. not necessarily promoting that, but it takes 35 seconds and no thought to to write a. And a lengthy screed on Facebook. So right. to, to box it up, to find the right address, to mail it, to go, you mean you have to go to oh, the yeah, post dude. office, you'll wait in line. It, there's, you know, you almost have to applaud. Like if you're going to do it, do it right. That's, that's impressive. And where are you finding the bulls address in 1992? You're calling information, dude. You're calling like directory information. Yeah, straight in up Chicago. 411. Yeah, exactly, man. So somebody's picking up that rotary dial kitchen phone, calling information, he probably makes mom do it. So she's sitting there with like a notepad, like in the shape of a duck because it's 1992. And, you know, she's <laughs> jotting down like, <laughs> OK, Chicago Bulls, care of the United Center, you know, blah, blah, blah. The whole thing is just attention, monumentally. Jerry Krause. And maybe attention maybe Jerry like, Krause, do yeah. you think they put like a Jerry parenthetical nickname Krause, like Jerry backstabber Krause or like Jerry rip yeah, my yeah, heart yeah. out Krause or something Jerry like that. Jerry rip my heart out Krause. Yeah. Okay, dude, that reminds me of something I want to ask you about from the from the the documentaries. But the other interesting thing from last night was um so I was trying to explain to my wife like how Jordan didn't get any negative press for like the first 8 years of his career. The guy was bulletproof. You know, the first 8 years it was all like McDonald's and Gatorade be like Mike and you know, such an overwhelming tsunami of positive press. Like the the Jordan rules, the Sam Smith book was the first negative thing like ever written about the guy, you know? And, and again, that struck me as a quaint, we'll never see that again sort of thing, right? Um, you know, that's of a bygone era in that everybody has negative press by the time they're <clears throat> out of college, probably. Yeah, I think uh, the closest is Steph Curry. But first of all, he was, you know, seven or eight years ago now. And yeah. and it lasted two years or three, yeah. not yeah. eight. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And even the guys who, like, very studiously avoid trying to get negative press, I don't know, like a, like a Kirk Cousins, just somebody super, like, apple-cheeked and smarmy and, and you know, like I'm, I'm a good guy, capital G, capital G. Yeah. Um, 
they end up getting bad press because people see through the cheesiness, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's um, like we just call Brady a kind of fake human. Like, we... yeah. We are we are contributing to what you're just describing. Whereas in totally. in 1994, he would have been what Troy Aikman was, which was just sort yeah, of the, uh, the 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 all American all star, you know, good looking winner. Yeah, even Troy Aikman though, like there was a sense of like you know he's doing he's doing media with like big chaws of tobacco in his cheeks, and he's going out and he's having brews with the boys, and there was a little more of a like a with the boys vibe with with Aikman than. Like Brady's just like a robot, you know, like I think he you get the sense that he finishes a game and goes home and drinks like vegetable shakes with his supermodel wife. And I don't know, lays in a oxygen chamber and, you know, they just like plug him in the next day, you know. Um, But yeah, dude, it's 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 kind of fascinating. Um, So, okay, back to the doc. I just want to get your favorite. I've got two questions. Number one is favorite parts. Let's just talk about favorite parts. Um, what, what have you enjoyed the most? Um, so I, I think I've enjoyed the, well, the soundtrack has been, mm-hmm. been money. Just though the, Amazing. the, the use of the, the music from the eras. So mid eighties, late eighties, early nineties and so forth. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of the stuff that's not of some of the like behind the scenes and things like that. I was familiar with the stories because um, Roland Lazenby's biography of Jordan is really in depth and covers a lot of that stuff. And he uses mm-hmm. a lot of the same sources. Um, mm-hmm. but the footage of it is awesome, especially like the footage on yeah. the bus, you know, where he calls Jerry Krause crumbs. Uh, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> for example, I think my favorites are, are the, the real early Jordan stuff though. Just yeah. the, the insane athleticism the, yeah. the highlights of him at, at North Carolina were maybe my favorite part because you just don't ever really see that because there weren't a lot of televised games back then. Like when he yeah. blocked the shot and hit his head on the backboard, um, oh, you just look at that. And, and I know that, you know, there's always the debates about how would Jordan fare today? How would LeBron fare in his day? I mean, both of them would be one of the two best players in their era regardless. Totally. totally. But, yeah, I mean, and then there's the... Just the footage of him just abusing guys on, mm. not verbally, but yeah. that, that happened too. Uh, but I'm trying to remember which, which team it was against. Maybe the, maybe the Cavaliers. Mm-hmm. And there's a scene where he just, he just slaps the ball out of a guy's hands. Like, and the guy recovers it. He, the guy turns around. He slaps it out of his hands again. And then he ends up just taking it away from him. And he just, yeah. he just bullied guys on the court. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was so. Yeah, those. I think those. Those are some of my my favorite parts. Just the kind of the, I'd say up through his first couple championships when he kind of changed as a player from the uber athlete to the mm-hmm. the more of the technician. Yeah, yeah, dude. Here's what's fascinating about that, and I agree. Um, he just seemed to be always in control of whatever the situation was, and I'm 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 saying that mostly athletically. Right. Like as an athlete, I feel like I did fairly well on the spectrum, but at no point did I feel like I was always in control. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) no one, no one can beat me. I know exactly what's going to happen. If I can conceive it, I can do it. I never felt that level of control and just realizing, watching this thing, realizing at no moment did Jordan ever feel surprised or taken aback by anything that was happening on the floor. Uh, it's just an amazing thing to watch. And I, I think that extended to his interpersonal life as well, right? Like just seeing him walk onto a bus and, you know, bus chops and get a card game going and hold court in the locker room. You know, this is a guy who was pathologically in control of every situation. And I don't know how much of that was a function of the fame or the money or just the gravitas of being that good at your job and having everyone defer to you. I'm not sure, but, um, yeah, he was just a high control guy. Probably. Okay. So this is interesting. You think he's an eight on the Enneagram Jordan? Oh man. Eight Um, or a one. Yeah, I think. Or a three. One came to mind, but, uh, I, I think it's, it has to be eight or three. Cause those are more of the steamroller personalities. 
By the way, welcome to the Annie F. Downs podcast. <laughs> I'm your host, Annie F. Downs. The uh, the uh, the the Annie Sports uh, Annie Sportscast. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would say I would say probably and probably a three because yeah. there he never looked out for the little guy. Like the eight is supposed I, to be the person who is is kind of has justice in mind, looks out for the little guy. Sure, sure, when sure, they're sure. when they tip, they get kind of egotistical and crazy. But three is just like the I will accomplish it at all costs. Yeah. Uh and I kind of chameleon my way between things. So I would lean sure. that way. Yeah, I would lean that way too. I think that's I think that's spot on. Um okay, dude, favorite favorite non Jordan character in the documentary so far. So of all the characters that have that have shown up in the doc, who's your favorite Non Jordan. Actually, no. I want to. I want to talk about something that that I love the most from it, and then we'll talk about characters. Great, dude. My thing is just the time capsule of life in the early nineties. <laughs> in in as much as okay, so like you're waiting around in an airport lobby in nineteen ninety two. You're reading a paper, like just seeing guys read the paper. I could watch hours of that, like Tex Winter and 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 Phil Jackson sitting around like reading the paper. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, newspapers, that's the Chicago Tribune. And my grandpa used to read that. And I don't know, I'm just charmed by all of the non cell phone driven stuff in it. Like if you do a similar doc in 2019 or 2020, you're filming a bunch of dudes like sitting there diddling their phones in an airport. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's a different doc. Like it's it's and just guys playing cards together. You know, I think the I think the phone has killed that sort of hanging out and like the hanging out aspect of this documentary is kind of amazing. Like everybody needs a, a Ron Harper in their friend group, you know, like Harper's just the guy at Jordan's elbow, like saying yes to everything, you know, agreeing to these like massive buy in poker games and golf matches and, you know, just seeing people hang out in that yeah. way. I think it's gone. When, you know? and even the, even the scene, you know, where, where Rodman, uh, so it was the season Pippen was out. I think it was Rodman's first season with the Bulls. And mm-hmm. he, he got kicked out of a game. His head wasn't in it. And his mm-hmm. version of apologizing to Jordan was to go to his hotel room and say, hey, you got an extra cigar? And just yeah. like there's sort of a there was sort of a, a whole ethos and vibe of like this is this is camaraderie. Totally. This is what it looks like. Totally, dude. Yeah, I find that kind of and, and it probably makes me a savage and a horrible person to say this but i you're I already that, a savage and horrible person because you're a middle class middle-aged white man so just talk carry on in a man's voice yeah, <laughs> yeah no, vulner- the worst. no vulnerability voice so yeah yeah i might as well be swinging a club right now you know um gosh what was i gonna say oh just that i i find that way of life appealing you know what i mean there is a simplicity to it there seems to be an unspoken like hierarchy like Rodman didn't have to sit down with like Paul Tripp in a room and Jordan and be like well here's what I meant and here's how you took it and when you say I feel like like just bro do you have a can I get a cigar (laughs) you know and Jordan's like oh we're good now um like that kind of thing really appeals to me yeah and uh, I'm I'm sure there's something about that that's not emotionally healthy totally but there's something about it that's profoundly emotionally healthy too, where there's just an understanding between comrades in arms, really. I mean, comrades in yeah, basketball, yeah, yeah. where it's just like, oh, now we're on the same page again. And there isn't, yeah, there's no sort of subtext tension, yeah, passive aggressive nonsense. Yeah. Right. We don't have to go like 4,000 words on this. We can just understand that stuff gets said in the heat of the battle. So, so the school that I coach at, um, Lane College. We had uh, a head coach that was there for a long time. He's no longer there, but you know, our coaches' meetings before every game. And this coach was he was awesome. He had played in the NFL, and he was kind of Jordan esque in terms of his his gravitas. And people were kind of scared of him, but he would always say before the games to the coaching staff, like, "Look, we're all going to say stuff in the heat of battle. Just disregard it, basically. Like, don't don't carry it off the field with you." And don't let something that gets said in the next three hours, you know, dictate your relationship with each other. And I thought I thought that was really wise, actually. Um, And not that it was just this blanket, um, 
you know, invitation to be an a-hole for three hours, but, but it, it was, it was wise on the level of don't let what gets said in this context ruin that context. And, um, I do miss that. So, okay. So favorite non Jordan characters in the documentary, who you got? I think Jerry Krause is the most fascinating character. Oh, absolutely fascinating. I don't, I, he's not my favorite because I don't know how he could be anybody's favorite. Like he's just, he's the weirdest. Yeah. And, and the most sort of like he, he did genius things and then he yeah. completely ruined genius things. And yeah. And he doesn't look the part of anything like he, yeah. I don't, I'm trying to think what he, like what character is he in a movie? Like if he's the actor, I mean, he's. Dude, he's George Costanza, like early Seinfeld George Costanza. But even like if you saw Costanza walking down the street, you'd be like, "There's a short balding man." If you saw Jerry Krause yeah. walking down the street, you'd be like, "There's a cartoon character." Dude, maybe he was Newman. You know what I mean? Yeah, From- he's he's a little bit more. Yeah, he's more Newman, and he has a little bit of that like evil genius vibe. And, yeah. Except, I mean, what was he like? Five three. Yeah, he was a real short guy. And uh, yeah, just a. Uh, Dude, I, I've got. I, a- I have. I have. Like I pity him, and yeah. also I'm mad at him, yeah. and also I'm kind of impressed by him. Okay, so here's my alternate universe Jerry Krause theory. In 2020, in a world that's driven by a sports world that's driven by analytics, could you make the argument that he was a genius, and could he engineer his persona such that he kind of paints his himself with a genius brush? You know what I mean? In, in as much as, like, so not re-signing Scotty, or like, like playing hardball on Scotty's contract in the '90s, in a non-social media, non-analytics-driven world, was viewed as like, I don't know, just stubbornness, stupidity, whatever you want to call it. Um, but I wonder if, in a post-Moneyball world, Kraus could have made the argument that, like, look, it's it's going to be inefficient to throw a bunch of money at Scottie Pippen. I disagree, but I, I wonder if he could have painted himself with the analytics brush. You know what I mean? Well, and I think there's something to be said for the fact that the Bulls are one of the first small ball teams, you know? So yeah. the the positionless basketball. Now, the difference is that they played a very old school style. It's so yeah. weird watching games where 10 players are inside the three-point line. Well, dude, totally. And where the Bulls insist on like, we got to come down the floor and we got to throw the ball into our worst player. Yeah. Like we've got to let Bill Cartwright touch it on every possession, which I, I get was like a, a tenant of making the triangle offense work. So I understand that, but like, I don't know. It was just, yeah, it's just such a funny incongruous non modern era thing to see that happen. Yeah. But then the flip side of that is you get, you get guys who can, you know, so when, when uh, Rodman Harper, Pippen Jordan are on the court together, yeah, they can guard everybody besides you know Hakeem Olajuwon. But then who could totally. guard Hakeem or David Robinson? Like stars okay, are stars, exactly. and so yeah, yeah, they 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 were doing then what, um, what uh, what teams are doing now? You know, where you got like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, and and these different things where it's like it's switchable, it's whatever, and and you know you in their in their first finals. There's the there's the scene where Pippen decide you know that he's like I've got I've got magic, and he just locks him up. Yeah. Except Jordan had been guarding it, but Jordan needed to kind of facilitate the offense and be the scorer. And you just you look at that and you go, yeah, man, that's so. Kraus put together a team that that was doing what nobody else was doing. And yes, Michael right. Jordan was the star, but they were great when Jordan left. They were great for yeah. two years. Well, one and a half seasons without Jordan. Uh, because the rest of the team was still really good. Phil Jackson was yeah. a good coach. Their system was good. Pippen was a is an all timer, and yeah. and so yeah, I think Kraus. I think if Kraus could learn, and and I and that's where I that's where I don't I don't know. Like if he could continue to learn as the game evolved, he was he wasn't a bad GM. He just had a yeah. bad ego, and he was running up against. He had a terrible little man syndrome from what I can tell. And then he ran up against the most egotistical athlete in the history of the universe. Well, dude, that's why I think Kraus would have done well in 2020 because little man syndrome kind of isn't a thing anymore because you're not allowed to be like 
you, you can't have this swaggering, archaic like culture anymore. So even even just we t- we talked about it in a joking way as far as voices on on one of our last steps, but like the analytics guy with the little mouth, you know, mousy kind of effeminate voice is a that's a totally acceptable thing now. And I think it's an acceptable thing even in front office contexts where there's just more leeway for somebody who's who doesn't fit the paradigm. You know what I mean? If, if you're not, um, I don't know, Dan Issel, some six eight like Greek god who played in the NBA, you can still be a GM now. You know, which I mean, um, by and large, I think is great because it, it means yeah. basketball has gotten smarter. And yeah. I think, and that that's really the measuring stick now is: are you smart enough to do the job? Are you yeah. are you able to adapt? Are you able to 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 you know play within the rules of salary cap and whatever? And yeah, yeah. no no poli- the power structures have changed so much that you know I, yes, superstars still run things to a degree. Mm-hmm. But if a superstar, if it came out that LeBron James was making fun of his GM for being short and fat, he oh, would dude. be he would get canceled. And yeah, not only dude, that, they prob- they'd probably crucified. suspend him for 10 games or something, oh, you totally. know, like there's, there's just totally. a whole different, there's a whole yeah. different, uh, just existence and reality of these things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, the thing that baffles me though, is that Kraus never, like once he was done with the bulls, he was just done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Dude, I, here's the question. So I'm thinking about this from the thousand foot view and thinking about myself and us watching it and thinking about how abhorrent and just unconscionable it is for Michael Jordan, who you could make the argument that he was the richest, most accomplished, best looking person who's ever lived. Six, six Greek God making fun of Jerry Krause for being short and fat. Like it's, it's one of the most reprehensible things ever put to film yet. How am I walking away from this thing going, yeah, I really like Jordan. You know, he's really likable. Is it just because I I grew up with posters of him on the wall and I'm I'm viewing all this through my nostalgic Jordan glasses? Like, what's the deal? It's because you and I view these things from a competitive standpoint. Like, yeah. there's – in when when your goal is to win, the ends justifies the means. Or if it yeah. doesn't justify it, at least uh, whitewashes. And, yeah. And so – yeah, we grew up worshiping at the feet of Jordan as the greatest basketball player who ever lived. So everything else that happened is, it's not defensible. It's not okay. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't matter. Yeah. In, in in this sort of watching view where I'm, I'm 100% sure that if you brought somebody in who was not a basketball fan, never mm-hmm. didn't grow up watching the game, maybe they understand the game a little bit so that they're not lost. They would look at this and they'd be, they'd go, that, that man is not okay. That Jordan yeah, fellow well, is it is the world's biggest a hole. That's my wife, and she's been watching these with me, and you know she's enjoying it because it's just good visual storytelling. Yeah, and you know she she knows we're into sports, and it's like appointment viewing for my boys and I to watch this thing together. But but yeah, that's her view of it largely, and I'm like, well, yeah, but he's Jordan, you know, and she's like, well, yeah, but he's you know the six six rich Greek God making fun of a short, you know, little pudgy guy. And it's mean. I'm like, well, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, there's, there's no real elegant defense of that other than what you just said, you know, and sports being the ultimate like results driven business and it being 1992, there were just a lot of reasons why it was different and, and more okay back then. I, Um, I think it's probably an indictment of, not necessarily you and I, but the the generation mm-hmm. that we grew up in, because there was, uh, I'm going to say some things that, you know, they'll, they'll offend some listeners. So if you have children in the room, you know, cover their ears. Like there was a time when making fun of somebody for being gay, calling somebody a faggot, uh, yeah. short, fat, physical appearance, like those were all just mm. on the table. Those yeah. were how boys, yeah. and, and the NBA was essentially grown up boys. They're playing a game for a living. Totally. That, that was, that was acceptable yeah that acceptable and right are not the same thing so this isn't a defense but just a when right. you look back on it and you know so as, as much as we kind of roll our eyes at things that have been lost over the years we've definitely mm-hmm. gained in the sense of like yeah we we've learned that destroying somebody for their physical appearance or their sexual orientation or whatever is not okay and yeah. 
And not only it's not just that we've sort of abided by those rules. I think there's genuinely a sense of oh that that ruins people. Yeah. Uh, and so, but we grew up in the era where that's the way fat kids at school got talked to and short kids at school got got talked to. Like sure, I I have distinct memories of. I was a I was a fairly chubby kid up into middle school. I wasn't, you know, wasn't corpulently fat. I was still, you know, athletic and things like that. But I was, yeah. you know, I was just like one of the, like I played I was the one who looked like a catcher, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I remember I playing playing um recess football and having some kid make fun of me for for being bigger. Mm-hmm. And I was like 12. And so those things stick and that's the kind of thing that I don't think would not fly now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, no, uh, you're. So yeah, I, th- I think there's, I think there's an aspect of this that is generational, era, mm-hmm. and then, and then also when you're looking at this from the the aspect of competition, the other things just pale in comparison to accomplishment. Which maybe yeah. that's an indictment on us as well. Yeah, no, I, I think it is, and I, I think you're, you're right about all that stuff. And I think what the doc does really masterfully, and I don't know if this was intentional or not. They balance all that with these images of Jordan just being incredibly magnanimous on the other hand. You know what I mean? So he's like really chumming it up with these minimum wage security guards from the United Center who, let's be honest, like kind of lost the genetic lottery, right? I mean, they're <laughs> – yeah. they, they, they don't have a fraction of the beauty and the grace and the charm that Michael Jordan has, but he's magnanimous, which is another interesting like – male group dynamic thing where you take a guy who's basically an a-hole around anyone who he feels is a threat to him, but who can be incredibly kind and magnanimous around people who he perceives as 0% a threat. And I think that's a, that's a character type that has carried on into today. Like we could probably all name, you know, we could name four people to whom that applies, you know, uh, in our, in our own lives. And I think Jordan was that guy, right? Like if he, if he perceived you as in no way a threat, he could be really good to you. Um, but if in any context you were, you know, you, you were getting too close to something he would just destroy, you know? Um, and Jerry Krause of course was a threat because he held all of these guys, financial futures in his hands. And, Dan Marley was a threat because somebody said he could play defense and Clyde Drexler was a threat because some reporter said he might be as good as Jordan. We just don't know it because he plays in Portland and, and then Jordan just systematically destroys all these people. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely a personality type and it's, I mean, I don't know if you have that in you. I think I have some of that in me where yeah, if I there's somebody, if there's somebody I perceive as, a social threat, like they're, they're funnier than me. They are smarter than me. They write better mm-hmm. than I do, whatever. Like there's, yeah. there's a, a draw towards, I need to diminish that person. Yeah. Even though nothing is gained by that. I don't make them any less funny. I don't make myself any funnier, nor do I make their <laughs> writing any less good or them right. any shorter or whatever. So, yeah. but it's, yeah, it's a, I think amongst very competitive people, that's a, that's a thing that comes out because because you take competition to where it's not supposed to be. Like, you're not supposed to have competition in a relationship. You're supposed to have competition totally. within the bounds of a competitive environment, games, yeah. sports, um, even business. But, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's hard not to be that way sometimes. Totally. So this is the blessing and the curse of growing up in the athletic culture. Right. And I've, I've talked to like my dad about this a whole bunch where you grow up, you're a football player, let's say, and All of the rhetoric is, and this is literal, this is like verbatim, you have to hate losing. Uh, You can't be okay with losing. Losing should make you sick, Um, et cetera, et cetera, such that you develop these like psychological muscles where, okay, anything less than winning or dominating a rep in practice is unacceptable. it, It makes you into a certain kind of person. And it can be hard to turn that off in like normal civilian life, right? So all of a sudden you're not an athlete anymore and you're walking around in life going like, who's a threat to me? I have to destroy them, you know? And some of that, some of that machinery I think is good, right? And, And we talk about this all the time with like 
the societal pendulum swinging so wildly in either direction. And a lot of my students now, male students, don't have any of that machinery. So it's like they're, if you're just a wet noodle, you know, you're kind of culturally acceptable in 2020 as a dude who's in college to be this kind of wet noodle where, you know, everything makes you anxious and you're, you're not doing okay. And you know, all that, um, it's, it's registering socially, but they don't have any of the equipment to like compete on any level, Yeah, you know? So it's like, you're trying to find this middle ground where your kids are capable of competing in a mean world, but they don't become mean people. And uh, that that can be a hard thing to do. Well, yeah, and it's and you think about any hero who you've you've appreciated from you know from stories or from sports or whatever. The best ones are the ones who can turn it on and turn it off. Like they they yeah. fight for the right things and they're compassionate yeah. with the right people. Yep. And and they don't fight when it's not necessary. Nor are they soft when they need to be hard. And yeah. you look at somebody like Jordan, and you're like, he was just hard all the time. Yeah. And you look at a lot of young men of today and you're like, Nope, they're just soft all the time. Yeah. And, but when you try to find that middle ground, you inevitably misstep, you know? Yeah. So you, you turn an, you turn a confrontation with your kids into a competition instead of compassion, mm-hmm. you know, and then you have yeah. to win and you destroy yeah. a child in, in mm. the moment, or you just sort of lay down when you needed to stand up to an injustice or a, a falsehood or something. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's, it is really, it's it's fascinating to watch the Jordan doc as a bit of a mirror, but also yeah. as a bit of a as a generational mirror because mm-hmm. because it's I I suspect I haven't talked to a lot of a lot of younger like, basketball fans, but my guess is that if you you asked a twenty five year old basketball fan what do they think of this, their responses to Jordan are going to be distinctly different than than you and I. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. They're going to be no, much I, more torn on the big man. He was great, but also what a tool. Yeah, and yeah. I really hate him or something like that. Whereas you and I, we, like, our instinct is not to hate him. Our instinct is to be like, yeah, yeah it was Jordan. who's was great. And we, we <laughs> no, just, man. we just gloss over some things. Oh uh, dude, we've got, we've got Jordan glasses on big time. I wish I could show this doc to my students, but with the caveat, be like him, but like, 50 to 60% like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and I would be, I would be showing it to my students and pausing it going, okay, don't do that, but do this, you know, the, the kind of maniacal work ethic, the like competitiveness on the floor. Um, even that sense of it's okay to be confident. You know what I mean? Like, so I teach writing and it's sort of, hardwired into young writers to be super apologetic about their work. And I'm just like, no, if you know, it's good, just like, it's okay to feel good about something that you write. You know, you don't have to do this sort of kvetching, caveating self doubt thing all the time. You can just feel good about it. You know, like that's right. That's on the table. That's not against the rules. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess trying to like give people this mixture of confidence and humility and what we're, what we're talking ourselves into here, I think is something that only like Christ can provide not to Jesus juke the whole podcast, but, um, but we really are talking about, you know, something that we really only see in scripture, you know, this mixture of like, you know, masculine kind of certainty that you see from David mixed with, you know, the kind of humility that allows you to, to bend the knee when it's appropriate. Um, yeah, that's kind of ethereal in a, in a non-believing person. Yeah. And I, I think it's also, I think it's it, what you were just saying is really important as well, because it, um, there's sort of a manhood paradigm in Jordan that, mm-hmm. that was, that was a bit generational as well. You know, he came from like, he was, he was, was he, is he Gen X, I guess? Cause uh, he's, he's probably early fifties. Dude. Yeah. Probably, probably on the, the, early side of gen x yeah yeah so i mean he he's he's he, you know america's greatest generation baby boomer mm-hmm. parents and and so he has sort of that hard manhood exterior and like we talk all the time on the other podcast about like kind of ragging on the different versions of manhood that have been caricatured <laughs> well he yeah. is a caricature and uh, totally but the 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 sort of what do you call it like an overcooked limp noodle 
yeah. is, is also a caricature. And that's, you know, what you're saying is like that, that the middle, the best characteristics of both are things that are only found in, you know, in Christ, but they're also like, that's, that's what makes a, like a good man, as opposed to a, the worst caricature is a man on the hard or, uh, yeah. on, or weak side. Dude, totally, totally. And I think it's just, we're a reflection of whatever paradigm of manhood we grew up with, you know? And yeah, for us, we happen to grow up in this kind of harder public school, early nineties, you know, version of manhood that even then, I don't know if I could have articulated it, but there were things about it that I was not okay with, you know what I mean? And I'm sure you felt the same way. Like, you know, you're, you're in those locker rooms, listening to all of it, feeling not quite okay with it, but probably not saying anything, you know? Um, and I think in 2020, like <laughs> the majority of dudes don't even make it to the locker room, you know? Um, and the, and the locker room is different. So there's, there's a, and we need to wrap this up. I realize we've gone over an hour, but there's, there's like a cultural anthropology aspect to this where in 1992, where everybody didn't have the computing power of a small nation at their fingertips, you were playing cards, reading the paper, busting chops. Whereas now, like, I mean, the locker room is silent. You know, you walk in and everybody's like either got their own headphones in or they're texting somebody or, you know what I mean? Like everybody's in their own individual digital world such that like the locker room is literally a different place, you know? And, I, and again, I'm thinking yeah. about where I coach now and you know, how you, in 1992, you walked in and like whoever the alpha was chose the music and the music was loud. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of talking, a lot of chop busting. And now you walk in and it's, it's largely silent. Um, it's just different. You know, I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just different. Oh, it's worse. Yeah, it's worse, dude. I mean, I I think, I think part of, you know, being an effective team is some level of camaraderie. And that doesn't mean you need to like each other, but you need to mesh with each other. Like the bulls are a yeah. good example. They didn't like each other. All of them. Yeah. Either there was probably yeah. groups who did, but they meshed, they had a dynamic and there is no dynamic when it is a, I play my position and I look at my phone. And yeah. It's, so yeah, I think, I think you a hundred percent lose something when you, when you don't have the, the meshing and I will get that person's back no matter what, like the episodes of the yeah. Jordan one where, like, where they're going against the Pistons yeah, and learning how to stand together against a team that just st- oh. stomps you literally oh. yeah. uh, is um, like that. That's a fascinating part. And you can't do that if you know, you go in and you, you throw your, you throw your, you know, your big headphones on and you listen to your own music and stare at your yeah. own social media. Dude, that part of it is like catnip for me. Like it literally makes my heart beat faster when I watch that. You know, I'm just like, yes, this is this is sports. You know, watching like, um, I don't know, some Chicago Bulls player, Horace Grant, like step in between Jordan and John Starks and like guy, just guys having each other's backs. You know, it's kind of a magical thing. Or yeah, and and and, and the part where the Horace, they, the Pistons got inside Horace Grant's head. Mm-hmm. And and he was just so and so like Jordan and Pippen and and uh, who was it Bill Cartwright or was it Charles Oakley at that point? Yeah, basically had to pull him aside and be like, "You need to be stronger than they are. Like yeah. you need to hit back." And there, yeah, there's yeah. just sort of a the, the whole dynamic there that it's almost impossible to imagine happening today. Totally, dude. Totally. But yeah, those guys were right. They didn't all like each other, but when between the lines, they were all for each other. And, um, it, it's part of the master stroke of like, and we could do a whole pot on this, but you know, Phil Jackson's interpersonal acuity, you know, um, strangely, I think that's one that does translate to 2020 now, maybe, maybe a phoneless 2020, but like, I, I think you, Phil Jackson is like leftist and Zen, zend out enough that like he he totally plays to a 2020 audience. See, I'm not sure he um, does because he did it in a very like Maven sort of way. Yeah, he's sort of yeah. the expert, the the yeah. one on the on the high hill talking down to others. Whereas yeah, you can't the, be an expert anymore. No, the the coaches today, like Steve Kerr and the other you know really good coaches, are the ones who are among the players. So yeah. same 
same direction, very different style. Yeah, no, you're right. That's a good point, man. Yeah, the days of the Maven, the the sort of sage voice are over. Um, yeah, dude, just so much about it that that's fascinating. That uh, it, it's it's one of those rare pieces of media that I I do just want to share it with people, you know. And I don't think that's a function of you know the quarantine or being starved for media. Let's face it, dude. We we live in a streaming world. We got all the media in the world at our fingertips. It's not like you know, everybody making this argument of, oh, it's so popular because there's nothing else to watch. Well, yeah, but not really. Um, I think this thing would be trending at a high level, even if everything else was even if we had baseball, for example, or I think, you know. yeah, I think there are people who are watching it like your wife, for example, who probably wouldn't if life was at kind of yeah. a full tilt. But yeah, but the people who love it would love it anyway and would totally. watch it and it would be appointment viewing. It'd be, mm-hmm. you know, it would do just fine. Absolutely. Appointment listening, Piper, like our program, you know, um, we, uh, we appreciate our listeners and we've appreciated our listeners, our sponsors through this quarantine. Um, shout out to everybody for continuing to listen, continuing to download, uh, for running to iTunes and giving us five stars. Uh, we're not really interested in any other feedback or critique. We don't read that. Um, so if you're not going to give us five stars, don't bother. But uh, but yeah, download, subscribe, five star this bad boy. Uh, help us get some more sponsors, some more money. Piper, we have uh, we've gone longer than normal. We've gone an hour and ten here, man. Uh, little marathon app of NFL draft and the last dance. But this has been a blast, dude. It's been a pleasure. Um, I've enjoyed this very much. Michael Jordan is worth every minute. Dude, he is. He is such an icon. Um, Last old guy statement, and then I'll wrap it. I don't think there will ever be anybody like that in the culture. You know, I, I I don't think there's a single athlete or figure who, like our generation of kids, will look back on and have it be that unifying, you know? Um like you didn't like the bulls but even in not liking the bulls you're still a you're still a de facto like jordan historian as is almost everybody of a certain age um i don't what, think there will ever be that again and i didn't like the bulls because of my respect for michael jordan not yeah. not like he that didn't diminish it my dislike for them was ah here comes that the best team with the best player who always beats us totally dude totally yeah i get it i get it Fascinating figure. Um, so watch The Last Dance. Um, think about it. Listen to this podcast. Keep listening. Um, and until next time. The Happy Rant is brought to you by Resonate Recordings. If you go to ResonateRecordings.com, you can see the full range of services they offer. So if you're considering starting a podcast, they are the ones we recommend going with. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see their prices, to connect with them and ask any questions, and to see what they can do to help you launch, edit, master, and improve your podcast. Again, go to ResonateRecordings.com to see what they can do to help you launch and improve your podcast.